Kiki Ki Ma Ma Ma. Welcome to the Cult Film Showdown's exploration of the 2005 2006 series Masters of Horror. I am your host, Jim Kata, and I am joined by my fellow judges in the Cult Film Showdown, Nick Boxer. Just a second, I got to poop. <laughs> and, and while we're waiting for that, uh, Jack Hall. Yeah, so Nick pooping is not the most disgusting thing we'll discuss during this episode. <laughs> oh no, I went there on purpose. Yeah, not not even not even in the in the if you'll excuse the pun, not even in the running. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> So yeah. Masters of Masters of Horror, a, a Showtime series, uh, TV mature audiences uh, is the rating they would give it now. Uh, and this was an anthology that ran uh, 26 episodes. And this is uh, this is halfway. This is episode 13 from season one, uh, which closes out season one. And I'm uh, and uh, this was quite a thing. And uh, I'm going to have Jack tell us who our Masters of Horror are this time. Well, it, it stars Billy Drago, who is a well-known, uh, was a well-known, and passed away in 2019, but was a well-known B-movie and guest uh, TV star. So mm -hmm. being a B-movie star, he started in numerous horror films, along with numerous uh, sci-fi films, along with numerous <laughs> action films. <laughs> Quite a few credits to the man's name, as you would expect. Um, it, it's, it's based on, a, I don't, the, the person who did the screenplay, I would, didn't find any information on, but it's based on this original awful by Japanese uh, author, uh, television commentator, and porn director, Shimako <laughs> Iwai. Uh, she's uh, um, kind of a big deal, actually, over there, believe it or not, uh, you know. And uh, and directed by a man who uh, Takashi Ike, who is I, I don't, calling him a horror director would be inaccurate. Um, at this point in time in his career, he has certainly gotten a lot of uh, notice for Ichi the Killer and Addition, and and those are more. Well, Ichi the Killer is torture porn slash action film, and <laughs> Addition <laughs> is torture porn slash torture porn. And uh, he's done family-friendly films. He's done action films. He's done horror films. He's done just about every genre. Is one of the most controversial and uh, and interesting directors in Japanese film. I, I think it's fair to say. Um, fair his enough. work is either you love it or you hate it. Uh, his two thousand. We can love it and hate it at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think that's possible too. I mean, his work is is uh, in horror. Um, like I say, I mean, uh, movies like Addition, not a typical horror film. Even this is a typical horror. Uh, this episode, but it's he's more. Um, I mean, he did do 2008's One Miss Call, which had an American remake. That's a horror film. So I mean, he has worked in the genre. Calling him a mass, I, I think he's a masterful filmmaker. Um, within what he does, calling him a master of horror, I think, is probably not fair to the man's uh, overall scope of his of his career. I think once again, it comes down on your definition of horror, because I would not argue this is even horror in the least. Really, it's something else entirely. But we'll get into that. It's yeah. Well, I, I it, he himself had uh, said the reason he was interested in making this was because it didn't remind him of a horror story it reminded him of a scary story like an old story that would be passed down and told uh, for generations even though i mean it isn't that old enough story but but it's like an old story that we passed down for generations through word of mouth uh, a scary story that that is a you know not not typical horror so uh i don't know if that helps at all <laughs> but that is what he said. <laughs> this particular piece of work, and and now get to the particular piece of work, uh, Nick. <laughs> Tell uh, people what the story yeah. is. 
Well, uh, Billy Drago, who coincidentally is the least disturbing fil- thing in this film, uh, <laughs> which is like the direct opposite of every other uh, Billy Drago film, is he's usually the most disturbing thing. Um, stars as a English gentleman who is returning to Japan in search of a prostitute he once abandoned. Um, he's getting down to the last brothels in Japan, I, and uh, and at the at the end of the last lean, he's told that she's not there. He's disappointed. Uh, he hires another prostitute uh, to you know bide his time while he's there, or so he has a room to stay or whatever. And she tells him. Uh, Good night story that not only tells the the story of the prostitute he's hired, but also the prostitute that he's looking for. Um, and she has a certain way of telling it that tells multiple versions of the same story within the story. Uh, but all this is just basically excuse to hit the audience's buttons if you have problems with infanticide uh, infanticide patricide molestation incest um body dysmorphia um torture if you don't like looking at heat this <laughs> is not something you should watch if anything presses your buttons her tail is there to freak you the fuck out. (laughs) There's a reason this didn't air on TV. I can't imagine my reaction if I was just flipping channels and accidentally stopped on any given image in this thing. (laughs) Um, It is gross. It is disturbing. um, And it's part of art that, or maybe part of art that I have the most trouble with. It, it sticks with you. There's there's no unseeing this type of thing. I can't totally discount it as art, but at the same time, I end up thinking about it for a long time. So does that's probably an art thing. Um yeah, I told you what happens. I, I don't think there's a reason to get into details. Uh I'm oh. sure you guys will do that. <laughs> think you have to discuss the details. There. It's a. Uh, it is such a challenging. It's challenging work to watch for sure. It's uh, uh it is uh, uh, if yeah, if you have any buttons, this will push one of them. Um, <laughs> I think that's the point. Is he had yeah. a checklist of of buttons to press. Yeah, I think there was a there was a quote by the guy who made. The movie Blonde that Blonde had something to offend everyone, and I, I've I've seen Blonde and I've seen uh, Imprint, and uh, <laughs> I I think there's there's something to there's something to completely unsettle you as a as a human being in Imprint. <laughs> the thing is, though, I mean, I mean, I feel it's a brilliant piece, like it's brilliant filmmaking. It's difficult. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's extremely difficult, but that's because it's so well done. You know, it's so well acted. It's so well shot and, and so well paced and everything that that everything hits you. And because it is so brilliantly done and it's it's I mean. It might be the most interesting episode we've seen yet. I mean, there's a, you can definitely see why it didn't air. I mean, it, it, it was it, it, he was working the whole time with with uh, Showtime and trying to, while he was filming it, trying to stay within what he thought would be the guidelines <laughs> of what he expected on TV. And when he finally showed the cut to Mick Garris, Mick Garris went, I think we need to make a couple of cuts. So they made a few cuts, then showed it to Showtime, who went, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just, Just no. hard no. Like, <laughs> and I don't know if it's the... The extended torture scene that would have been too much. I think that would have been too much. The extended torture scene. 
as yes. well as all yeah. the well, the no other way to say it, the the dead fetuses that are discarded like garbage <laughs> regularly throughout this throughout this episode uh multiple you know dead babies on dead fetuses on on screen is just over and over yeah. that's that's too far you know for i won't that, just say american audience especially got me it was yeah it's that's, a lot for sure it's uh uh and uh it's funny that um uh nick had told us but because uh, nick had seen this however long ago and he had told us you know this is this is a thing this is like this didn't even air um so get ready and uh, so we're excited to get into this and i mentioned that to my wife lacy she doesn't normally watch these with me so so she's she's on her phone and she's kind of half watching and, we're, and i'm about 20 minutes in and she's like is this really the one that that nick said would uh you know was like not shown on air like what's there hasn't been anything that would hold it back and then all of a sudden <laughs> it changes <laughs> and from then on it's like i don't know how you could ever think that this was going to air and it's not like this is the first time his work has been too extreme i mean his work in the past has been banned in multiple countries across the world mm -hmm. you know and and so it's not like you don't know what you're getting with him and what and and that Mick Garrison and Showtime should have known what they're getting with him. The guys, the point of his filmmaking is to, yeah, like is to push those buttons, is to push the boundaries of of good taste. Now, I watched it going, I think this is brilliant. It's harder to watch, but I do keep in mind it's fake. Like <laughs> You know, oh, none I, of these I don't things... think the special effects in this are good enough to believe it, but the mere ideas he presents are so horrific. Yeah, that they're effective. Yeah, absolutely, it is because it is so well done. It's effective. You know. Yeah, I think that is the the big challenge watching it is that, uh, like you said, it it's so well crafted that it brings you into the story in the way that a like a lesser product a, a lesser production would have left more of that would have rocked that suspension of disbelief but you're absorbed in the story the way he's taken a while to settle you into the story that like bringing you in telling you the fireside thing um that all like catches you up which when the horrifying things happen one of the horrific things happen you're in it like you're not there's there's no part of you that's like Oh, that's like you know, you're just that's just a thing that's hap a movie that's happening in front of me. It's it, he's created a reality to it. So when this stuff happens, um, you, it's you're really already shocking. off guard because, well, the main cast, uh, Billy Drago, he's not like a normally looking human being. He's interacting with uh, actors that are a little bit off. I mean, the little person without a nose sort of sort of sets you off. Like this is a different world. The regular yeah. rules don't apply here. Yeah, that's absolutely true. <laughs> <laughs> the regular rules do not apply here. Uh, no, I mean, the effects were, you know, there's not a big budget on this. It, it, I was actually left wondering how they are doing some of these things and making it look so real. Mm -hmm. um, the funny thing is you could see points in this where you, he cut away just before something was, and yeah. you know, he's sitting there going, that'll be too extreme. I'll cut away there. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, that's a, yeah, that's like a horror thing that it's like, you often do that to pull it down to like a, uh, pull it down to an R that you don't, you don't see the blood flow or you don't see the instant that, you know, contact happens or something like that so you can bring it slightly yeah. down but um but i mean it's it, it's ineffective filmmaking it doesn't matter because you think you saw it uh like the uh psycho being the most famous chainsaw example massacre. sorry what? yeah texas, texas chainsaw massacre yeah. i think is yeah a brilliant yeah, example it, of that. the showers the shower scene in psycho um you never see flush gets stabbed with the knife but you think you did 
But in most of those points, I have my eyes closed. So <laughs> it doesn't matter if he pulled away. That torture scene, I, you know, I kept opening my eyes occasionally, but I got a problem with needles in the gums. I'm sorry. I got a problem with needles in the under the fingernails. Oh. Uh, I was, I was, uh, continually had to like shut my eyes. I I think I've watched this entirety the entirety of the episode three times now, and I don't think I've seen that entire scene yet. <laughs> well, I mean, it is one of those scenes that it's hard to watch the entire thing because, uh, you know, I mean, it's a, only a fifty minute episode and it takes up forty seven minutes of it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like it it is. Like you're you're sitting like yeah. sitting there watching it at first, and it's like, okay, there's a torture scene, and then it goes on, and it's like where it would normally end after like thirty seconds. Yeah. Then then they just start smiling, and they go to the next step, yeah. and then you're like, okay, well now it's over, and then they go to the next step, and then I think they go twice more and torture her two other ways, and it's like by the time it's done, it's such a long scene of just watching this. I mean, just brutal, brutal torture mm-hmm. that is seems so realistic that you're literally, I'm literally sitting there watching it, not even so much horrified as, as, and shocked as, as like, it, it's surreal. Yeah, I think if you, if you put this out of context into like a Mondo Kane style documentary you would think it was real uh like you could be convinced that the that uh, in context that this was a real yeah, thing the muppet coming out of her head sort of okay well that's that doesn't happen i don't mean the whole episode i mean the torture scene <laughs> the uh this is uh uh to give exact times uh, you know jack was joking about it but it's uh it still sounds like an exaggeration uh 63 minutes of episode and six full minutes of the torture. And that's not even all the time you see that it's that's the unbroken segment. And then there's more scenes that show her, uh, show the woman after she's had all she's uh, been pin cushioned in the face um, that uh, pinhead from hell uh, from Hellraiser is like, I think it's a bit overdone. Uh, <laughs> I kind of would love to see a behind the scenes interview with the people involved with that scene. I'm kind of wondering if some of it wasn't like a fun shoot behind the scenes, that is. Because it is really over the top. I know it's all special effects, but there is no way that that actress was comfortable. You know, I mean, the way she's tied up, but I don't care if she's double, triple jointed. Yeah. The way she's tied up alone would be uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah I mean, that'd be that'd be a long day because there's I, there's makeup. Well, there's I like, might be attributing too much to movie movie magic, but. <laughs> there's something about the structure of this that I really liked, which was um, so as Nick, to- uh, as Nick said, um, like he finds where his love has gone. He at this woman that he meets knows what happened to her. And so she tells him and it's a sad story. And he's like, you're not telling me everything. Like I know there's more. So she tells him a bit more. She changes some of the details uh, to tell him more of the truth. And, uh, and then he's like, like, and it gets more horrifying. And then they do that like a couple more times. That uh, so it becomes this theme of like, how much of the truth do you really want? Uh, like she's dead. It's like you're just asking for more things that are going to like hurt you. Uh, but he keeps asking. Yeah, I, I thought it was brilliant. To be honest with you, that concept and the way it was structured. And again, the way it's paced and everything, the, 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 and the reveals. And every time you think you can't get more horrific, the story, mm-hmm. it gets more, it manages to yes. get more disgusting. Now, um, did you guys get the sense that he, even at the beginning of the story, is dead? He dies when he crosses the river, and this is hell. And this is punishment for him killing his sister and abandoning the prostitute. That was my take. 
Hmm. That's an interesting take. I never considered that. That makes me want to watch it again, unfortunately, <laughs> just to see if that's the case, because it would explain a lot. Yeah, I had that. I had a, a similar but not uh, the same thought at the end because uh, um, they they show him after all of this. Uh, and uh, at that point, I'm like, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure that everything that I just saw happened or if it happened in his mind or like what what part of this was real um and so i did have that sense near the end of uh is this like what was the reality of the thing i just watched um and all the speaking characters other than him could be classified as demons of some sort mm. um they all have some sort of body dysmorphia going on um <laughs> It it is weird when Billy Drago is the only upbeat character in the whole story, <laughs> and, he, and he's trying to find his like lost love who's probably dead. <laughs> yeah, Papa Papa Jupiter from the Hills of Eyes, two thousand six, is your shining beacon <laughs> and light in this thing. And that's your... his sister, because we already mentioned that, that is the. <laughs> um. Yeah, it, it, that's an inter man. That's a really interesting take, though, because it really does explain the other characters. It does explain the whole why he is suffering so much, uh, you know. Mm. And it, it's one of the the fact they killed his sisters will reveal at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're spoiling this one for you because we're not, not quite suggesting not exact. You watch it. Yeah, it's not completely at the end. It's late, but it's for it's far along. Yeah. It's far along in, but yeah. the point being, we're not suggesting you watch this. Unlike you know, most of the time we do, we're saying watch it if you are prepared, because yeah. it is gently done. But but it's probably too much for you, so ninety nine percent of you shouldn't watch it. You know, yeah. <laughs> and, I'd, I'd say be and, ready to tap out on this one. Yeah, I, I was yeah. I was kind of actually surprised neither of you did. I I kind of thought we'd have a case of this is garbage. <laughs> and I uh, feel bad once again for suggesting something that just didn't go. Well, we were going to do this one anyway, so we were in for it, in with you, Nick. Uh, the uh, uh, it my my wife having like as I said was watching bits and pieces, and at one point she looks up, and there is one of the uh, as as Jack said, there there are lots of fetuses in this, um, and. Uh, she, my wife looks up and there's like a lot of fetuses on the shot <laughs> and, and she's like oh you don't need to do that <laughs> that like, pretty no, much sums no. up the episode <laughs> it's uh yeah it's just it everything is so I, it, and as yeah as i was saying like every every time she embellishes the story every time she adds another layer it just gets more horrible <laughs> by, if, by if there a... is one thing that didn't work it was the other reveal we talk about the muppet in the head and we won't give too many details mm -hmm. in case you are going to watch this but if anything was a little bit meh, it's it is probably the production values and the and the reveal of that it's it's it mm -hmm. i wouldn't say it felt out of place but it wasn't it it was the one thing that didn't feel real. Yeah. You know? The teeth grossed me out, though, at the same time. <laughs> it, it was still gross, but it was like, it was gross in the way that basket case is gross. Like, it's, <laughs> like, it, yeah, it is like, it was the part that felt low rent compared to everything around it. Um, and, uh, and that's a difference in filmmaking, too, because, you know, um, like, movies like Ichi, and uh, and the like that I I haven't seen that many, but the, those I've seen, they tend to be well lit. They tend to be clear, even if like the props not the uh, the effect isn't as great as you might want it. Whereas an American film will just darken the hell out of it until you barely see it. That's a good um, point. Is, is there an American equivalent to that? I, I think I mean obviously torture porn stuff, torture uh, torture horror. Um, I mean, I would actually say that the closest analog to this is Cronenberg. Um, something like uh, Naked Lunch or Videodrome. 
um, like body horror. I was mm-hmm. thinking video drama would be. I mean, and there are scenes in Hellraiser that yeah. that are, you know, but I don't know that anything goes as as far as often as many you know mm-hmm. as long as as this does, and this is only a, a sixty three minute episode. It's, yeah. you know, if he had had 90 minutes, I can only imagine what we would have been subjected to. Well, we'd, we'd have a film like Audition that I've never made it all the way through. So <laughs> I didn't either, but not because it was, I, I just, I was thinking it would be hot and sexy. I'm like, this is the exact opposite of hot and sexy. <laughs> this is the most opposite yeah, I of hot and sexy. Mike Mickey in, into too many spank banks. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't want to know that guy if there is out there. So <laughs> that's a time not to write in on the YouTube comment on the YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, when I uh, was watching it. I wasn't familiar with what I was getting myself into at all, and I was like, "No, I wanted like a hot chick, and she's in this edition." <laughs> <laughs> You're starting. And, and you're starting with like a guy goes to a geisha, and uh, you're like, "Oh yeah, I'm in for this." Yeah, 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 something like that. But uh, this is, uh, man. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, yeah, I, you don't see like from the director of Zebra Man. You don't put that on the box of this. <laughs> no, but you know, I mean, this is the same guy who made Thirteen Assassins, which was an international action hit. Mm-hmm. You know, both in it had its success all across the world, including in North America. Um, and it's a terrific film. Again, is it's not that he's not, and he, like I say, he's done family films. Well, that's what I meant you by know? Zebra Man. He, that's his. That's a huge series for him over there. Okay. But, like he's, he is. If nothing else, like I say, uh, maybe you love it and hate it, as you say, but. If nothing else, like you won't you won't say he's not interesting. He's an interesting filmmaker. One of the most and and it tends to be online his reviews. A younger generation thinks he's brilliant, and an older generation thinks he's disgusting and should be shot. And that's kind of the the kind of when you look at the reviewers of his work, the younger generation, um, you know, is he's very popular with them. Older critics do not like him at all. Yeah, and, and that that'll swing because uh, I mean certainly there's tons of content in this that uh, the uh, modern audiences would would put the problematic stamp on. Oh yes, <laughs> I do love that the uh, DVD cover says "banned from cable broadcasts." Like it's oh, advertising; it. it's a selling point. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean that that was always the uh, the uh, the unrated sales pitch was like this this is the version they wouldn't let you see, uh, and, and whoever whoever they was you you still want to get it over on they no matter who it is who they was. Well, this time you might want to thank them. <laughs> I'm assuming yeah. from its runtime that that they didn't that they left it at its original time because. Most of these episodes run just under an hour. Uh, and this is a couple over. And, and so he says that it runs 53, 53 minutes. And you had said 63. Uh, so. I, I I can check that to be at, to be like whatever I want. Yeah, what I watched was 63. Was 63. So yeah. maybe that this was the completely unedited version that Mick Harris said, let's make a few cuts to. Yeah. And, can you imagine you made 10 minutes of cuts of this thing and it's still too much? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's I think it's hard to completely excise the uh the uh the fetus scenes, um, which are plentiful. Is it the, scene or is it the torture scene that's too much? <laughs> the torture scene is is uh well I mean it's it's all too much. Let's let's just agree that it's all too much. <laughs> I, I think probably if it, the only way to release this on uh, on commercial television would be to, uh, uh, I guess, like this would be basic cable. Um, the the only way to release it is after he heard the first version of the story. He went, "Oh, I'm so heartbroken," and then went home and didn't yeah. <laughs> didn't say, "I think there's more to this." 
That would be the fear itself MEC version. That's right. <laughs> that uh, I mean, the fear itself, uh, the the spiritual successor to Masters of the Horror <laughs> that aired on NBC. I can just imagine them uh, having a you know uh, a ban on <laughs> anything Japanese <laughs> after this. <laughs> Yeah, that they, they will go years without bringing in a Japanese director. <laughs> like yeah. that, that doesn't work out. Just trust me. <laughs> He's big in what Japan. Season two, the final episode of season two is also a, a Japanese production of Masters of Horror. So I mean, we'll get to it now. Now the question is: favorites, highlights of the season, of season one. Highlights of the season. Making me remember what oh, we did this season. By the way, was there any Canada spotting? I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, basically, uh, that's just Grafton Street um, at night. Yeah. <laughs> ah, <laughs> yeah. Well, and you have to you have to take a a, a load riding boat across the River Styx to get to North Van. There's that. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah, not none this time, none this time. Um, so highlights of the season for you, Nick. Um, of season one, I enjoyed uh, a heckle's tale a whole lot more than the first time I saw it. Hmm. Um, and I was re- relieved to uh, relieved that the premiere episode, um, that the Phantasm director directed, um, Incident on a Mountain Hill, I think. Um, that one Incident held up. On hill, I think, or Mountain Road. Mountain Road, yeah. Mountain Road. Yeah. That one held up way better than um, uh, before. If you'd asked me before this rewatch, I would have said that Cigarette Burns was my favorite. Um, but that one didn't hold up as well. I mean, it's still a good watch, but it's. It's not. It's no longer my favorite of this the the series. I think I have to go with uh, Incident on the Mountain Road. I think the two that really stood out for me were the uh, were Jennifer and uh, Dear Woman, uh, just because they were uh, they were like more of the type of horror that I tend to watch. Um, they are. Uh, uh, actually, yeah, it's sick girl as well. Like, just I think I was drawn to the ones with like really prominent um, actresses in them, um, and because especially uh, back in '06, that was that was unless it's the final girl, you didn't get a lot of um, female antagonists uh, or and or protagonists. So those are the ones that I kind of drew away from. I thought that uh, uh, ones who are a, uh, lesbians. Yeah, which was also uh, in two thousand. Yeah, yeah, that's also pretty, um, uh, pretty out of its time. Well, I mean, as as far as being brilliantly made in every way, imprint is as good as any episode of the season. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there's no doubt about that. But it's also not one that you would recommend to anybody. So you can't list it. So you can't list it as a. <laughs> it would yeah. be possible to list this as a favorite, but it is possible to to be uh, to be drawn in by the the artistic quality of the of the episode. Uh, I love Pick Me Up. Um, that's probably my second favorite. I love Incident uh, on and off a mountain road. I, I like anything that's based on a Joe R. Lansdale short story. So, I mean, I, I enjoyed that quite a bit. But Pick Me Up is my second favorite. I love Homecoming. I laughed so hard at Homecoming. And uh, and I thought it was unbelievable how it still is relevant. Uh, Fifteen years later, this could be happening right now. And it yeah. would make sense this entire – it fits into current day's politics – even better than it fit into politics in 2006. Mm-hmm. And that to me is, is really amazing. So, um, and, and it's just funny. Um, <laughs> not scary, funny. So yeah, Homecoming would be my favorite, but uh, I respect a lot of about Imprint and uh, Pick Me Up was the most fun. Yeah, I did really enjoy Pick Me Up just as a, um, 
yeah, just a, it, it is, I'd say that and, and Sick Girl the ones that I thought were the most fun. They're just, because there's, like, Sick Girl's just so wacky. Um, we're not picking the same thing. I mean, I think that's a, yeah. a success of the series. You know, I think that's, you know, I mean, you're saying Jennifer, we're saying, you know, uh, uh, cigarette burns, yes and no. And we're saying, you know, uh, Hakel's Trail, like we're like we're all over the place. I think that's a good sign for the the quality of it. It's not like it's mm -hmm. one thing. It, it does have something for everybody because there is so many different styles and so many different types of stories. Yeah, I mean that's that's always the strength of a good anthology is that like if you're not enjoying one, just go to the next one. And I find that nowadays that doesn't work as well as it used to because there's such a strong central voice that you can go to the next one and you're like, well, this feels a lot like the one I didn't like. Like just 10 minutes ago uh, whereas this is like they they really let the directors and uh, like run on these um, oh, and question. bring their own voice yeah um yeah if we, if we get to doing a couple episodes of fear itself or something like that it, it will be really interesting to see how when it's broadcast on network tv what changes mm-hmm how can you make it horrific when it's on network TV? Mm. You know, when so many. I, so I don't even know if we're going to. We want to see fear itself. Yeah, I, like I just just I'm very curious. I would I would definitely even if we're not doing it for the podcast, I would watch some because I would be curious to see if how do they try and scare you when they haven't got the shock value? Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can you can still do a jump scare on network. I mean, certainly, you know, shows like um, like the later Twilight, like the other series of Twilight Zone, the uh, X Files, things like that. You could do a jump scare, um, but a lot of these, yeah, a lot of these episodes you couldn't cut down to a TV fourteen. Oh no, no, no! And, well, and still have it. Work. Episodes have a lot of nudity and a lot of violence. A lot of you know, like like there is a very mature series. Yeah. All right. Well, that wraps up uh, season one of Masters of Horror. This has been a really interesting ride, and uh, we are back next time with the top of season two, which is called The Damned Thing, and uh, we are. The Cult Film Showdown. You can find us on Instagram and on uh, YouTube and on Patreon. Uh, support the the efforts we're making. Uh, maybe we'll add in a, a level for uh, making us watch uh, the NBC <laughs> Fear Show. <laughs> you can you can uh, you can make us jump through a hoop. Uh, we are sponsored by We Talk Podcasts. Uh, wetalkpodcast.com is the home of the octagon uh our search for the ultimate b movie and also we talk podcasts has a facebook and they have a twitter subscribe on youtube oh yes yeah, subscribe on youtube and uh we'll have we have a lot of new episodes coming to you and old episodes if you're just joining us uh, available on youtube and your favorite podcasting app until next time <laughs>